Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess it's a little bit earlier there. I'm on the East Coast, but nonetheless, uh, welcome to my talk, Revealing the Antivirus Quarantine, uh, really talking about using PowerShell to enable analysis. Uh, of course, you know where you're at. I'm ecstatic to be here, albeit virtual. Um, and I know just by looking at the Slack channel and everything else, everybody's having a, a good old time there. But nonetheless, let's jump into this. So who am I, right? So I'm Fernando Tomlinson. I go by Nando. I'm a principal IR consultant at Mandiant, uh, where I do digital forensics and incident response on a daily basis. I'm retired from the US Army. I uh, did 20 years. So uh, the first half of my career, if you will, was system administrator focused tasks. The latter half of my career was uh, defensive cyber, offensive cyber in support of our, our great nation. Uh, I have two tours to Afghanistan, uh, and I have a Purple Heart from some, some injuries that I sustained while I was there. I'm a cybersecurity adjunct professor where I teach Python, Linux, uh, digital forensics. I also teach PowerShell, developed that for the college uh, out here in uh, Georgia where I'm at. And uh, truth be told, I really enjoy teaching PowerShell over anything else, right? So go figure. Uh, I'm a PowerShell enthusiast. I code in the language almost every day in some form of fashion. Uh, Co-author of the PowerShell Conference book, Volume 2. Uh, I know that's a couple of years old now at this point, and uh, some of you certainly recognize uh, the benefit of the book. You might be benefiting from the proceeds right now, uh, so where applicable, please certainly support either through uh, buying the material or develop, uh, developing a chapter or two to, to help out with the cause. I'm on the internet in a number of different places, so uh, that's where I could be found. So let's jump into this. We're going to start off talking about uh, a little bit of history, right, if you will. So um, the history of antivirus itself, well, the concept um, really from a, excuse me, not antivirus, but from a malware perspective, malware really dates back to uh, the early 1970s. And it all started with a, a virus called Creeper. Its initial propagation vector really relied on humans to be able to transport from one system to the next. And it was entirely done through uh, floppy disks, right, offline. Um, some of us hear floppy disk and you're like, holy crap, I haven't heard that in a while. And other people are like, well, what's a floppy disk, right? Uh, it kind of makes you feel a little bit uh, older, if you will. Uh, but nonetheless, that was the first known malware uh, Bob Thomas is the uh, creator of it. That's neither here nor there, but really it was a, an experimental thing uh, that was all about being able to self-duplicate itself, self-duplicate the program um, to be able to replicate to different uh, mediums and, and platforms, uh, not to inflict any damage. That was certainly not uh, the purpose there. However, to combat that, if you will, there was a program called Reaper that was uh, released. And one may say, well, that's the first instantiation of antivirus as we know it. And if there's enough arguments, then we can go to the next instantiation to really highlight uh, the release of antivirus. And that was really in 1987. This was in light of the Myena virus and really from that perspective, it was all about being able to um, reverse the actions of this virus. This virus sought to infect uh, .com files on DOS-based systems. Uh, a, a German computer researcher is who came up with the, uh, the program to get rid of the virus. Um, and, and really from a history books perspective, we can say that that was the true first instantiation of an antivirus. Now, some con in initial contenders in this space, G-Data software, which is still kind of kicking out there, McGaffey Note 32, uh, Flush Shot Plus, and anti for us right? So we start to see very quickly some writings on the wall, and then um, a number of entities kind of jump on that. Now, while we talk about roughly five AV um, companies right there, there are hundreds, and in some cases, thousands, if you will, of antivirus companies, right? Um, any and everybody is jumping into this space, uh, declaring that they're the next generation antivirus. Not saying they are or they're not, but we really face a different, um, a different animal in today's arena, right? When we think about malware today versus 
what we might have called malware back then um, is much more sophisticated today and every day it evolves. It is interesting as I you know, respond to cases and support organizations that are facing and have faced um, intrusions and the malware that's being employed um, is bar none in some cases. And in other cases, it's really um, evident that that's what it is. But the invasion techniques uh, associated with some of the sophistication, right, it's all focused on how to essentially out or surpass the technology that's supposed to be doing the detection. So you can almost think of it in terms of it being almost like a cat and mouse type game. Now, in terms of the picture, right, as I mentioned that there is a substantial amount of antivirus solutions today, some of them are almost like this, where they have that gate up and they're like, yeah, we can block whatever but they're really not blocking anything or they're blocking the very um, evident uh, type stuff. And in the minute that there's any shift or change, they don't stand a chance. Now, from that perspective, uh, when we think of malware, there's a number of different types of malware that are out there. Generally, we have viruses, right? Pieces of code that uh, can copy themselves um, to different, uh, you know, uh, mediums, different items. We have worms, they replicate all by themselves to um, other machines. We have ransomware, which is really, really over the years grown significantly. And the pandemic has not helped in any form or fashion in terms of that, right? Because people are seeking to take advantage of misconfigurations, vulnerabilities in a machine to then be able to render the data uh, inoperable, inaccessible, and forcing people to pay a ransom. And when some people don't want to pay that ransom, then these operators seek to, um, I don't want to say blackmail, but they seek to um, release threatening data or data that if released would certainly have grave damage to the organization. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword in that respect. We have root kits that are very, very stealthy, um, operating in some cases at the hardware level, um, things that are, are operating at levels that some of our technology, most of our technology has um, a tough time to be able to see and really understand. And then we have Trojans, key loggers, grayware, right? And grayware really starts to get into uh, the spyware um, of sorts, right? Just uh, potentially unwanted programs and a number of other things. So while we have these types of malware that stem from very early days and just continuously evolving over time, we also have some interesting and sometimes considered scary statistics. So when we think of every day, right? Every day I get up, put my, uh, you know, my quote unquote uniform on and I go fight the good war. These are stats that I'm having to face, and maybe if you're in this space, the same thing, or even as a consumer or a supporter, operations support from an IT perspective that you're facing, right? 350,000 new malicious programs are detected on a daily basis. There's more than 970 million pieces of malware that's circulating the internet right now. There's been investigations that I've been a part of in which we found malware that was targeting, let's say, Windows XP. And this might have been a Windows 10 machine, right? And although that malware that's targeting the XP machine doesn't run for one reason or another in uh, Windows 10, it's still there. And the owners, the operations people, if you will, of that network, they have no idea that it's, that it's there. So um, when we think of, 350,000 that's newly released on, on an everyday basis. And then we think of over 970 or million that are just circling the internet right now, not taking into consideration how many of those pieces of malicious logic um, are almost rendered inoperable because of the platform that they find themselves on, right? Um, it's very scary. Now, if that's not enough, uh, the company I work for, Mandiant, as I mentioned, uh, do incident response and forensics. Uh, for just the year of 2021, the company has identified 700 new malware families, all right? 
Uh, there's been 365 distinct malware families during uh, an investigation of a compromised environment. So not what we just track at large, but in terms of an investigation, 365. Of those 365, 154 of them uh, were brand new, things that we started tracking in 2021. Now, we're one company of many, but when you think of in terms of what we're seeing, and then you start to multiply that with other organizations, you see that this is certainly a big problem. And for the perspective of the talk, as we lay that groundwork there, it really comes into, well, cool, I need to have antivirus on my system. You do need to have some version of antivirus, and depending on your organization, you might need to have more than one, so that way, in theory, what one doesn't catch, the other one doesn't catch, but you need to configure it accordingly, so that way they don't fight over each other, if you will. But what are some core capabilities that you may look for within there? Well, you certainly want something that's signature and heuristic uh, capable, right? From a heuristic perspective, you want it to be able to really start to understand um, not necessarily the signatures that they do this every time and that signifies that it's malicious, but really some of the characteristics associated with it that may not be as fine-tuned or fine-grained, um, being able to make that detection, um, detection uh, as well. Uh, from a signature perspective, that's great, right? Like I op I knock on the door, I open it three times, or excuse me, I knock on the door three times, I open it. Anytime I see that, that is a signature of maliciousness. So while that is great, it also has the propensity to miss things. As you could imagine, what happens if I knock twice or four times or don't knock at all, right? So signatures in that case is bad. If you're a more of a Windows person, there's also anti-malware scan interface, right? AMSI. AMSI has a signature in there that literally looks for the string Mimi Cats. If you're familiar with Mimi Cats, that's a, uh, a tool that allows you to dump uh, credentials that are stored in LSAS for you to be able to dump them in uh, plain text. Um, generally, you don't want that running on your network as you can imagine why. But nonetheless, if I just typed in Mimi Cats, um, AMSI would pick that up as bad, regardless of anything else, right? And there's other signatures as well. But in your mind, the gear might be turning because you're like, well, surely I can bypass that. What if I just break Mimi Cats down from a string perspective and concatenate it together? Or what if I used uh, the ASCII table and convert it to uh, decimal or something and then convert it back to chart. Yeah, all those things certainly would work because at that point, the signature um, is being bypassed. We also want something that's anti-malware in nature, um, really focused on uh, the malware makeup and um, purpose, if you will. We want something that's real-time scanning capable, meaning, you know, as a file is being downloaded, it is being scanned or as a file or item is being executed, it is being scanned. The days in which we have a antivirus capability that only did scans at noon or you know, one specific time or several specific times throughout the day, uh, while that capability is still inherent in there, that's not normally what we would want as a uh, typical setup. We wanna be able to scan that thing as it's being downloaded, also have the ability to scan it um, as it's being executed. Uh, we wanna be able to have something low level as simple as automated automatic updates. Uh, often I go into an environment and they have a antivirus solution and I'm not saying one's better than the next, but they do manual updates and the antivirus um, definitions are outdated, like not even by like a month, by several months, and in some cases, much larger than that. So we want something that's a little bit more automated and automatic in nature. Even if it's um, you have a test machine that it gets it, you validate, and then the rest of the environment gets all that stuff in an automatic fashion. When it comes terms to or come down to um, malware being detected, we want to have the ability where it tries to uh, clean that aspect, i.e. remove that malicious logic from 
uh, the item. That gets a little bit more difficult when we have uh, compiled uh, items or we have things that are packed, i.e. Um, utilizing some form of compression um, aspects with them. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, certainly a good capability. And then lastly, um, certainly something that quarantines it. So as it identifies it as bad, it isn't like, hey, that water bottle is bad. I'm just telling you about it. No, no, no. I want you to act. I want you to do something because I might not see that alert that says it's bad until much later. I want to be able to configure you to do something, to act on behalf of me. And quarantine is generally one of those things where it renders that binary or that item um, into a, uh, not into a place, but it, it um, puts it in such a area that it doesn't allow it to execute, um, either based upon the photo location or it does something to adjust the bytes associated with it, i.e. maybe it encrypts it, maybe it uh, zips it up and password protects it. There's a number of different things that AV solution uh, providers are using to quarantine a file or a binary. Uh, we talked about the protection associated with it because it essentially wants to make sure it is not in such a uh, state that it can continue to execute without some type of interaction. Maybe you come back in later on and you recognize um, a file or an item was quarantined. You have the ability to select an option in that antivirus solution and restore it. Maybe you determine it's truly bad. Well, then you can have it removed. If you don't do anything at all, Generally, the items that are quarantined will sit there for roughly 30 days, depending on the antivirus solution, and then it will auto delete. But nonetheless, you have options. So from that perspective, when we think about intrusions, well, how does quarantining come into play? Well, I present to you a, a tech life cycle. When we think about the actions that somebody of malicious intent would take um, to gain a foothold or uh, in, intrude in a network um, maliciously, there's a general process that they take. They want to do some scans on the network to do some reconnaissance. They want to utilize that knowledge that they've gained and actually seek to compromise um, something that will allow them in the network. They want to establish a foothold. This is where they might install a back door or some other uh, item that would allow them to be able to get in. They then would like to escalate privileges. You know, generally a uh, regular domain user might be the one that click on the phishing email, for example. Uh, so now that they have a foothold in the organization, they want to elevate to somebody with a little bit more uh, privileges and rights. And that's where escalate privileges comes into play. And from there, well, this machine is great, but what else is out there in the network? So then there's more reconnaissance internal to the network. And slowly but surely, it's an iterative process where they'll find a new machine, they'll maintain presence, i.e. establish a foothold, they'll look to escalate, do some internal reconnaissance, and continue until we get to the point of them completing the mission. For each one of those steps, outside of initial reconnaissance for the most part, um, and in some cases, initial compromise, we have the ability with a good AV solution to be able to catch some of the malicious logic and have it quarantined. This is good. Now, when that happens, you're largely looking to bring in or enact incident response procedures or digital forensics. Maybe you have that capability internal to your organization, and that's good. If that's the case, then you have access to the server, your antivirus server, and you can actually go in there and click the button to restore it, click the button to delete it, or whatever the case. When you don't have that, um, i.e. the server doesn't exist or you're uh, doing analysis offline, well, it gets a little bit more difficult, right? Like, how do I get that file back? And you may be thinking, well, why do I need that file back? Well, I look at it like this. I'm investigating um, an intrusion and the attacker has stolen um, $6 million, for example. Well, you bring me in and you want me to tell the story. How did they get in? What was the malware? All that other type stuff. 
And if the malware, suspected malware, is quarantined, well, I would want to have it in its rawest form so we can do analysis on it to make the determination whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. In some cases, the antivirus solution might uh, render or call upon something and say it's malicious, but it may not be malicious. It may be a false positive. In other cases, we would be able to get a good copy of the malicious binary. And for a malware analyst, forensic analyst, that is going to be huge. So let's look at a couple of things that we can do within PowerShell to get us uh, closer to that. And as we do that, um, you, you'll see my disclaimer. I'm all about disclaimers, right? And for some, this is going to be TLDR, too long, didn't read. And for others, this is going to be TSCR, too small, couldn't read. So really the cliff notes associated with this are this. I'm not saying that the methods that I'll discuss here shortly are the only capabilities to unquarantine a antivirus file. I'm merely highlighting a way that you could do it. And I haven't even really scratched the surface on all the capabilities. Uh, that a little bit more on when I get to my future work. So right out the gate, um, PowerShell actually has a few commandlets for Windows Defender, right? So uh, we highlight the uh, commandlets that are associated with it, and we add roughly 12 or so. Uh, the ones that are really, really big in terms of this are really two. One of them is git mp threat, and that's going to give us a history of threats detected on our computer. And what we see is uh, for threat name, I have a virus, they call it DOS, uh, ECAR test file. So this is a antivirus test file. It has a specific either string or it has a specific um, binary uh, uh, setting, if you will, or binary content that most AVs, all AVs would look for. And this is something that people would use to test and validate that their antivirus is actually working as, um, as designed. So from a Windows PowerShell perspective built in, we got MP threat, but largely aside from it telling me um, the threat name, I don't necessarily get a lot from that. So we also have a uh, get MP threat detection. And now we get a little bit more uh, granular in what we could actually retrieve, right? So we see the domain user, we see the initial detection date, uh, we see the process name associated with it. In this case, it's Notepad. So the minute I try to open that file with Notepad, it triggered. We see when it was remediated, i.e., when did the file get quarantined. We also see the actual resource. Now, resource is a little bit misleading, but really what resource is, resource is the actual, quote unquote, malicious file. Okay. So from a PowerShell perspective, already built in, that helps us. But that's very specific to Windows Defender. I'm going to show you three other AVs, uh, eSafe, McAfee, and then I'll actually come back to uh, Windows Defender, being able to do it outside of what's already built in for us. So uh, looking at eSafe, eSafe was developed in uh, 1998. It's only available for Windows. Uh, and there's a 32-bit version of it only. It was actually bought out by another company. Um, and to be quite frank, it isn't something that I would um, that I would purposefully pick up and try to develop code against. However, I support and have supported organizations that utilize this and had a need, which is why I kind of focused efforts on developing code for it. So. Um, if you have a file or item that is quarantined, utilizing eSafe, well, it has uh, random characters that it generates, and, and maybe there's some logic to the random characters. I, I don't quite know. Um, and then the extension would be .var, right, or ver, however you want to say it, essentially highlighting that it is a virus file. The data itself, um, the way that it's protected, the data is base64. Uh, encoded, right? So we can reverse that fairly quickly. Now, the quarantine folder, well, it's going to be in whatever the system drive is. And for most people, a system drive is going to be C drive, uh, program files, x86, eSafe, protect, 
and then there's a quarantine folder. If you were to look in that folder, well, you'd see something like this structure where there would be a dot var or ver file for every item that was quarantined and then there would be a ver backup.dit. Now, I apologize with the screenshot if it's too small, but that ver backup.dit is essentially the metadata file. So it has um, the random string of characters listed in there. The random string of characters, as I'm saying, is the, the name of the file. Like the first one begins with A5. In, in that backup.dit, it has that same string, and then it tells you what's the original name. It also tells you the size of the file and when it was quarantined. So the first one that A5, if, you can, if you're able to see the uh, screenshot there, it is the first line. The original name was uh, ecar2.zip, and then uh, it was approximately 388 bytes. And then it was quarantined on March 26th, right? So that same information is on the next line for the second file. Again, every file that is quarantined would be in this directory, and it would be labeled as .vir. The metadata associated with it would be in that backup file. Well, why is that the case? Well, as we reverse that process, that backup file is going to be the very thing that's going to um, help us understand what the original contents were. So this is just a snippet of the script I wrote. And any script I talk about is on my GitHub. But a couple of things in here, I, I won't go or really bore you with going through each line, but a couple of things. First thing I do uh, is I receive the item. I'm checking to see if it ends in .vir, right? And that the path um, is whatever the file uh, or that, that the path that they provide actually exists. If that's the case, then I'm going to check to see if uh, the path that they provided for the backup file, i.e. that ver.backup.bit actually exists. That backup file, I'll need to consult that to understand what the original name was. So when I reverse this process, I can apply the original name back to it. The other thing we'll do is we'll read in the uh, file itself. I'm going to split the file based upon a pound sign. Uh, we're going to go in there and there's specific uh, fields. So I'm going to split based upon offset six, uh, splitting based upon the, uh, the slashes. And then we're going to do some concatenation for us to be able to uh, make the path and the file name that we're going to write it back out to. The real big piece to all of this is here. As we read the contents of the file, uh, we're going to join those items together. And then the middle line there, we're going to convert it from base 64 um, back to bytes. And then that third line, we're going to write all bytes out to uh, output file that we would have already specified within this code. And at that point, we would have reversed that process. This one was not that bad. As we move on to uh, McAfee, if, as we move on to McAfee, McAfee is one of the most commonly used antivirus software. I won't say how often I see it or I don't see it. It is certainly one of, uh, one of the common ones that are out there. Uh, McAfee quarantines based upon triggers from McAfee virus scan. So it's very um, broken down into modules. The antivirus triggers are quarantined. They're not deleted, so that's a, a big uh, thing to highlight. McAfee, by default, stores the quarantine files for 28 days before it deletes it. Anything that it quarantines, well, it has a random set of characters, and it ends in .bup. So off to the right, I actually show um, a number of McAfee quarantine files. And as you can see, for me, there's no rhyme or reason um, with the random string of characters. However, they all end in .bup. This data is XORed, so they do bit shifting, right, to be able to um, hide this data or to uh, render it inoperable. Now, the key that's associated with this bit shifting is 06A. Luckily, it was published online, so for me, there was no reversion that I needed to do other than make something that I could have in an automated fashion reverse that process. The quarantine items themselves listed in system drive, which for most people is uh, C, and then it's gonna be slash quarantine. So it's right there at the root of uh, C. Now, same thing here, 
I only have a snippet. So the first thing I have where I'm declaring that key, I'm then going to read in the, uh, the BUP file. I'm then going to actually reverse that shifting. And this is the, the main meat and potatoes of the actual script itself. From there, I'm going to write those bytes out to a file. And then what I get are essentially two items. I get a details dot out. I also get a file uh, underscore zero dot out. The details dot out is essentially a metadata file. So as you can see, I'm checking to see if that file is details dot out. And then I'm matching on the original name. I'm essentially getting the original name out of that metadata file. Why? Because I'm going to take that data file and I'm going to seek to rename it to what it originally was. And then finally, on this one, I ended up uh, password protecting uh, that item as well. Um, this one was a little bit different. I found myself uh, not having an analyst machine to be able to do it on. So what would happen was I would uh, reverse the process and then McAfee would pick it right back up. I'd reverse the process, McAfee would pick it right back up. So in order to uh, break that for the time being, I just ended up uh, making a password protected zip file. Now, yes, we could disable it. Yes, in theory, I could do this outside of that platform. Um, I was in a closed network that did not allow me to do so when I wrote this. So Windows Defender, right, included in Windows 10, it is certainly the primary antivirus on Windows if there's nothing else that's there. It can run in a, one of a few modes. We can do active where it is the primary antivirus. We can do passive where it's more secondary. Or we could just put it in disabled mode where it's totally disabled. The quarantine location is actually in program data. Program data is a directory that's hidden by default. So you have to select show hidden files to be able to see it. But again, C drive, if that's your system drive, uh, program data, Microsoft, Windows Defender, quarantine. And when you look in that directory, you'll see something like this. You'll see entries, resource, data, and resources. So uh, this structure is really interdependent. So there's one file that actually highlights the metadata. There's another item that is the actual data itself. And then there's another part that we're going to use to actually do some decryption to then be able to open the follow on part. For this, uh, this script is actually pretty big. However, um, somebody, Optive Security, found out that Microsoft uses a hard coded static key to really do its quarantining. So this is highlighting that, that static key. The only thing I did was put it in an array, right? So that's cool. So I'm going to use that key. And the, the middle part that I talked about where um, it, it actually does some encryption, they utilize RC4 as a encryption mechanism. And this isn't necessarily a talk on encryption. However, um, I just took the process as articulated by RC4 and how it does encryption. And then I just reversed that process to then make a function that does it for me. And then what I get back is essentially the raw Windows Defender files. So for all three of these that I talked about, I don't need to be on a machine that already has these antivirus uh, platforms. I can literally take these uh, quarantine files, go to a machine that doesn't have that software and run a little bit of PowerShell and be able to get that data back in its raw sense. Before any of this type stuff was an option, people would find themselves, me included in my profession, were like, hey, we got to find a machine that has this software on there so we can try to um, use it to unencrypt it. Or, hey, don't take that quarantine file off that machine. We got to unquarantine it first and then take it off, right? This is a game changer for us. Now, I'm not the first one to be in this space, so I certainly won't take that, that claim. There are a couple of other people that have started projects here as well, and they're really some inspiration for me. Maldump, the, I won't say the bad thing, the thing to be cognizant of with Maldump is it's written in Python. Python, unless you're in Mac or Linux, isn't there by default, right? 
Um, the MalDump program, right now he's got eight different antivirus types that he can unquarantine items from. Um, the use of Python, though, and how he does the unquarantining uh, requires third-party libraries. So you're going to have to bring stuff in. If you're a programmer or have done programming at heart, you could find yourself in a dependency loop where no sooner than you grab what you think you need, there's another dependency, and then it's like a revolving thing. So if anything, that's the thing to be calling yourself. Um, it's got a pretty good tool set. There's this GitHub right there. Uh, there's another one, the X-Ray. It's written in Perl, right? Um, he does over 40 antivirus types, and he's actively still uh, uh, developing towards uh, that project. It also requires third-party libraries, so we just want to be cognizant of that. Uh, we don't have Perl by default on uh, Windows, so now it's a matter of you know trying to get to a workstation that has that. But you can find that script uh, at that location. And then really one of the ones that's been the biggest help for me thus far is this person has done a substantial amount of research in the quarantine formats. Um, he doesn't have code out there, but he starts to highlight and really uh, articulate the different fields and how the quarantine aspects are working with a number of antivirus solutions. In this case, he's got seven that he's focused on. So um, those are some other people uh, or other projects in this field that I'm aware of right now. Um, so that leads me to what's my future plans? Well, I certainly want to add uh, more antivirus decryption methods. There's a couple in the, uh, the shoot right now based upon my day-to-day -day work uh, that I think would be incredibly beneficial. Um, I ultimately, when it's all said and done, I want to combine all these antivirus decryption mechanisms into one program. So you can run it and then you can select um, through a menu or some switch or parameter rather um, which one you're trying to decrypt. Right now, I got three individual scripts um, and I see that being very cumbersome um, as I continue to progress and develop in this field. Additionally, I want to parse other artifacts associated with antivirus programs. So where right now I'm really focused on quarantine items, there's other aspects that AVs generally have. I want to start parsing those items as well and not being dependent of the antivirus solution. And lastly, I'd like to make this cross-platform. So as I talk about, hey, well, they're using Python and Python's not here, or they're using third-party libraries and everything else. I want to make this cross-platform. So now I'm not saying, right now you need to do this on a Windows-specific machine just based upon some of the uh, items that I'm using. However, I want to get to a point where wherever you have PowerShell, it's going to work, right? There's going to be enough checks and balances and logic validation um, to make that work in that space. So uh, that's it there. I do want to talk about something very quickly, a couple of projects that I run. One is called Under the Wire. It is free. It was developed in 2015. It has over 75, or not over, but 75 interactive challenges. The aspect or really the focus is on core aspects of the language. So people who are just getting started with PowerShell, um, it is task oriented and it gives them a purpose. Thus far had over 206,000 unique players from over 78 countries um, under the wire. You can find it there. The very premise of it is as you go on the site, I'm gonna give you challenges. And I say, I, it's me and two of my buddies that run this. We're going to give you challenges. In this case, the challenge is to provide the, or to determine, excuse me, the build version of the instance of PowerShell on the system. So we give you credentials for you to be able to SSH into servers that we have. So we're wanting to know what's the version or the build version of PowerShell of our server. And whatever that version is, right, you'll use some code to be able to, to make that determination. Um, in this case, we see the build version begins with 10.0. That uh, answer or uh, answer to that question now becomes the password for the next level. So you log on as Century 1, we give you a challenge. You just answered the challenge. Now you log on as Century 2, and that 10.0 whatever becomes the password for that. You'll go to the Century 2 page, there'll be a challenge. Whatever the answer is there becomes the password for Century 3. And then you just continue on. It is linear in nature, 
So if anything, you know, you might get to a point where number three is super duper hard. And then number four might be easy for you. It just really depends. Another project, Posh Hunter. This is also free. Uh, there's 90 challenges uh, in this one. And it is very defense and offensive focus. I give you a virtual machine that you can download. It is riddled with artifacts. I then get you, or in our platform, provide scenarios where you're performing duties as a penetration tester, a threat analyst, maybe a SOC analyst, or somebody doing forensics. But nonetheless, uh, you'll be able to use the artifacts that are already there in PowerShell to be able to answer the question. I take away explorer.exe, which is the um, graphical user interface that we see when we log into a Windows machine. And what you have in return is I drop the ISC and the PowerShell console. Those are it. So while I have some challenges that maybe if you had the GUI would be easy, it makes it a little bit more challenging when all you have is PowerShell. But guess what? Um, you know, that's different exposure that then gets you a little bit more comfortable with the language. Again, both of these platforms are free. That being said, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, this presentation, along with other presentations I've done, can be found at that link. Uh, my code that I've talked about here, and just code at large, as long as I can get it outside of my employer's hands, um, are found there. And then I'm on Twitter if anybody wants to connect with me. Uh, looks like I have three minutes left, give or take. Uh, I'll pause here, see if we have any questions. If not, I uh, certainly appreciate uh, you guys joining. Uh, well, no questions. Look, I'm a human just like all of you. You guys want to reach out and have a conversation. I would love to have a conversation about this stuff. So please feel free. Um, and I, I would love to chat with you on another medium. With that being said, thank you all for taking the time to, to listen to me talk about this. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Thanks, guys.